<laughs> but but even though the best player on the Rams was acquired via the use of a first round pick when Les Snead was the GM, Les Snead now has a clear disdain for first round picks <laughs> to the extent that they had a t-shirt a made with a bad word on it. <laughs> I love Chris's it. favorite word yes. appearing on the t-shirt. Yes. Here's Les Snead talking about his F them picks, F dash dash K them picks t-shirt. <laughs> Hey, here's what I know. The late John Madden said that winning the Super Bowl was the highest of high. So you know what? Our players, our coaches, Stan, his family, every one of us in the organization who support him on that mission, and everyone out there, you know what? We know what that highest high feels like today. So in honor of the shirt, F them picks. We'll use them to go win more Super Bowls. Uh, uh, Les Snead playing the role of the just about fully drunk uncle at the barbecue, blaming somebody for putting a dent in his fender. That was kind of the whole demeanor of Les Snead there, wasn't it? It was. It was. It, they, they, it's why I like that group out there in L.A. And again, it goes into it's just they kind of wear their heart on their sleeve. It's not an act. They're not politicians. You know, you kind of what you see is what you get really from the players down to the coaches. It's the McVay culture we talk about so often. Uh, and, I, you know, I like it. I really do. It's just not your normal, you know, we're going to say the right thing football talk. And, you know, I'm always going to, you know, CYA, cover my own ass with comments and all that. And uh, they're just uh, – I, I find it refreshing that they kind of – play with the narratives and they know what's out there in the media and they don't act like oh we didn't know we don't read it I, I, I think that's what's kind of cool about the Rams I really do it's what I like about McVay and Les Snead and they got a lot of self confidence in thyself and that's why they're going to be running it back with the super team well if they're going to be trading away more picks they're not going to be trading <laughs> they're uh, out, any they're first out rounders of picks. until 2024 <laughs> look at that it's amazing look at that their first pick is a compensatory pick in round three that they got because the Lions hired Brad Holmes to be their GM last year. They have, after that, a fifth-round pick and two picks in round seven. A point that Peter King made last week, they do a nice job of using their late-round picks on players who contribute. But you know what? They got no choice. They guys have to contribute. When you got no other picks, they become the, the, the centerpiece of your draft class. You better get them ready to go. You better coach them up. But... Uh, you know, less need, and, and they've developed this vibe where they don't put the same importance on first round picks that everyone else does. And they, they'd rather get premier players instead of taking their chances with a lottery ticket, even though Aaron Donald was a pretty damn good lottery ticket that they returned. Yeah, no, no doubt about got, it. I mean, all these guys, all these guys they have on the team from the draft right. the last five years, not first rounders. No, it's uh, it, it's something that I've talked about on my podcast quite a bit because I get questions about you know their team building and it, it you know one of the one of the ways that you know, you know the Rams they have to have great confidence in their ability to draft with what they've done with some of the draft picks. I think that's part of the reason they're not afraid to do it though. You know that that, that is the point. You know I think we've discussed it in the past too. Yeah, there's a ton of middle round contributing football players on that team. So, one, they have the confidence in that aspect. You know, two, I think to your point, they are about over the proven, over the potential. They, they, that's one thing I learned, too. They're going to take proven over the lottery ticket that you said every day. Uh, they made that very clear to me when I was out there last week. And, you know, the other thing I find interesting, too, is just, you know, I, and I, I didn't really know this. It really wasn't, you know, an intended plan. It kind of just fell on their lap, the whole thing, the super team, the, you know, all the stars. It just was like, hey, this guy's available. Okay, let's get him. And then somebody else came available, and they were like, whoa, okay, wait, we, I would love to have him. Wait, we, we can figure this out. Let's try to do it. Okay, let's get Jalen Ramsey. And it kind of just went so on and so on. But there was never like, I don't know, I guess when I asked Sean McVay the question, I thought he was going to like tell me, yeah, you know, me and Les were sitting there, you know, three years ago. and We decided, you know, let's take this route and do it this way. And that wasn't the case. It was really one of those things that kind of just happened organically and they've kind of just run with it. Well, and one of the main reasons they did it was they had to get rid of Jared Goff. Yeah. And, and – 
one of the picks that they threw overboard was the first rounder that they tucked into the Matthew Stafford deal to get the Lions to take the god-awful Jared Goff contract off their hands. I mean, they got no business being back in the Super Bowl after extending Jared Goff's contract in the 2019 offseason. That was a huge mistake by them. It was. And they had to give up. They had to pay dearly for that mistake, giving up two ones and a three to the Lions for Matthew Stafford. And it worked short-term. Long term is going to be a different issue because how many more years is Matthew Stafford going to play? What what could those two first round picks and third round pick have been? We'll never know because whoever the Lions take with those picks, it doesn't mean that's who the Rams would have taken with those picks. But it, you it's, know, it's, it's already proven everybody's it's worth though, right? Don't you think at least? Well, you, that's right. You, yeah, well, right. You got a Super Bowl trophy out. Yeah, yeah. You got a Super Bowl trophy, and and I I uh, the the writers at PFT we exchanged text messages to let each other know what stories we're going to be writing. And Josh Alper uh, texted just during this segment that he's posting on Brandon Bean, the Bills GM, talking about taking swings like the Buccaneers and the Rams have done the yeah. last two years. And yeah. I responded to him, well, does he, does he plan to? And he said he'll make a move if the right opportunity arises, but what about two or three years from now? Well, two or three years from now, they can't take away your Super Bowl trophy. No, that that's it. And if like you, you go all say, in and win, yeah, you you'll figure it out later. Right, and like you always say, they, they, there's lots of ways to finagle this thing. You know, we sit here right now and go, whoa. You know, we look at the Rams team and we go, oh, whoa. I, I'm, I, I wonder if they can keep everybody next year and extend everybody. But, you know, again, you look at pro football talk yesterday. I know you guys, you wrote an article. I can't remember if it was you specifically. I look at other websites. Like, the Rams are not in bad salary cap space by any stretch of the imagination. It's going to be very easy for them to finagle an extra 60 or $70 million out of the cap. Yeah, I know there's going to be some repercussions down the line somewhere. But right now, the time is now. You go for it. So that, that's, that's what they're doing. And, and, Mike, I mean, I know during the season – we talked about it a few times with the Buffalo Bills and the Brandon Bean situation, right? I remember us having the conversation going, they need, remember, they need Odell Beckham Jr. OBJ they need was another available. star, right? They need another star on offense and they need another star on defense. That, that's, hey, when you watch the Kansas City game, what's the difference between the two teams? Kansas City just got a few more playmakers than the Buffalo Bills. That was the, that was the, it was the, the same team, except Kansas City had two or three guys that just said, I don't need the play to be perfect all the time. I can just make it happen because I'm that great. And that's where the now, Bills, to me, missed the ball a little bit. They do have Josh Allen. Though, Gabriel Davis. Gabriel Davis did all right. He did great. I know that. Game. I know that. But, but just think, just think. You take Von Miller and OBJ. Take him from the Rams, put him on the Bills. Yes. Would the parade have been in, in Western right. New York that's yesterday? A, that's, that's Maybe. Right, right. right. And that's where I think Aaron Rodgers and Green Bay is probably looking at it because they tried to get OBJ and Stephon Gilmore. They didn't try very hard. Yeah, but you know, because they, you know, they don't have enough money. They couldn't do it hard enough. I mean, that's another issue too. But, yes, your point's <sighs> real there. Yeah, your point's real. I don't buy that salary cap nonsense. You can make it work if you really want to make Green it Bay work. Green Bay never makes and anything work. So I don't know what's going on in Green Bay. They never make anything work. Yeah. I don't. So I can't Draft back and them develop. up. Yeah. Draft and develop. Right. Draft and develop. Draft. And, you can't be – you can't be all of one thing. You have to be willing to consider all options when you're building your team. Right. And and draft and develop as an exclusive way to build an NFL franchise doesn't work as well as it could. You have to be willing to make your move and shoot your shot on free agents or trades who become available. If you, there's a player out there that you think is going to make your team dramatically better, you find a way to get him. Period. Like the Rams Agreed, do. agreed, right. I think you look at a lot of the top teams in football, they, they've taken that approach as of lately. You know, you just you go through the list. Tennessee, I mean, they did that. They did the draft, but they've got a lot of free agent moves too that helped their football team. You know, whether it be some of the guys on the defense, cornerbacks, Julio Jones last year. I mean, you go through the list. Kansas City, we know they made their moves, right? You know, I mean, New England, of course, their moves they made this past year. We know Tampa Bay. The Rams, the Arizona Cardinals have made a lot of moves over the last two years. The 49ers have a mixture of things as well in their football team. You know, to me, you're, you're exactly right. That's the point. You can't just think you're going to do it one way. Now, you're cheating yourself. You're cheating your organization. 
You know, there, there's just times where you got to break the mold a little bit and go, you know what, this guy puts us over the top, even though it's not what we usually do or the structure and how we do it, but this guy will put us over the top, a.k.a. like the 49ers with a Trent Williams or somebody of that nature. you got to make that move every now and then to give your team juice and just get that, like we talked about, you don't always have to worry about the X's and O's. The Jimmys and the Joes got to make some plays for you at times, and that's what the Rams had. We saw that. The Jimmys and Joes came through in a big moment, and the X's and O's weren't always there to support them. And I understand the idea of trying to build a team that is relevant and that contends year after year. Everyone wants to avoid 3-14 and 14 because 3-14 and 14 gets people fired. Yeah. So if you can build a team that is always in that range of 10 to 12 to 13 wins, you've got maximum employment security. But you're never going to win a Super Bowl. That, that's, that's the Vikings model. Just good enough. Just good enough. Never great for fear of having it all fall apart, but just good enough. It keeps everyone employed. It keeps the train moving. It keeps the revenue rolling in. Every year we're relevant at Christmas time when, when uh, the kids make their list and they want Vikings jerseys instead of Twins or Timberwolves or Wild jerseys. I mean, they want to go to Vikings games, not the other game. We're, they're, they're relevant, but they never go grab the brass ring. And the Rams are showing us, and the Buccaneers showed us last year, if you want to win the Super Bowl, you got to go grab the brass ring. And if you fall off the horse in the process, hey, th- that's one of the risks you have to take if you want to grab the ring. Right. Bold moves get it done. I mean, bold moves get it done. I mean, I mean you, you, you're right. You talk about the Rams. You know, you talk about, like, the – Kansas City Chiefs trading up in the draft to get Patrick Mahomes to get their team over the hump that way. I mean, there's a lot of examples we can go through to go through, wait, the team had it, and then they added the one or two players to now go, wait, we're a playoff team and we're good, and to, oh, holy crap, now we're a Super Bowl team. And, you know, again, the Patriots, they did it all the time. I mean, you know, Aqib Tlaib, Darrell Revis, Stephon Gilmore. You know, I mean, that, that's what they did. You know, and then some bunch of value guys behind that, you know, just to, to fill out, like, the importance of their team. Oh, like little role spots. So, you know, the, the, you're exactly right in that aspect. And that's where, again, we've gotten into the Rodgers, Green Bay. I think it's frustrating with them. But, you know, I, I think we're seeing teams that are a little more willing to go aggressive, a little more willing to go with the proven commodity and waking up to this, the, the fact of, like, you know, what kind of you've always said, Mike, you've always been all over it. It's, it's a little bit of a crapshoot. You know, hey, you look at the Raiders and what they've done with the Khalil Mack trade and all that. I mean, they really haven't got that many good players out of it. We went, oh, what a great trade for the Raiders and all that. Well, you know, I know Khalil Mack hasn't been the superstar the Bears wanted, but he's been really damn good. And they went to the playoffs two out of three times, and it was because of the defense. And that was a move that got them over the top and made them a playoff team. And then there was the Raiders with all those potential picks. And, you know, it's a potential piece of crap right now. And, and there's two phases to this. You've got the off season when you have a chance to really sit down and make your plan and and figure out what you're going to do, like the like the Rams did. Excuse me, with Matthew Stafford last year. I think the real challenge is during the season, during the grind, during the one game after another game after another game, and you're busy all week long preparing for the next game. Having the capacity to tap the brakes on your preparation for the next game, to carve out time to sit down and have the conversation, a meaningful conversation. Because and this is where I got to give Sean McVay credit, because he's the one. I, he's the one calling the shots there. He's kind of like John Gruden in that he, he's he's. I don't I don't know whether it's humility or or he doesn't want to get blamed for the bad decisions. But I, I think McVay's got the power there. So Les Snead's got to corral McVay. Get him to take some time to sit down and talk about these possibilities. And McVay has to be willing to do it. It's too easy when you're caught up in the week-in and week-out grind of football season. It's too easy to say, screw it. I don't have time for this. I don't have time to watch Von Miller film. I don't have time to figure out whether or not this is going to fit with our defense. I don't have time. We, we have a full schedule of getting ready for our next game. Don't bother me with this now. And I think some teams probably have that attitude. Some coaches... They give off the vibe, and the front office knows, 
don't don't bo- no don't don't bother coach with that now. He's caught up in preparation for next weekend's game. You got to be willing to set aside your regular work to focus on the question of is this the opportunity that we need to take? Is this the guy that's going to make a difference for us when we get to January? And uh, that that's part of the challenge of finding more time in the day. There's only so much time in the day to do your work. And I think the great coaches will will stop everything they're doing focus on that and then still find the time to get their other work done i agree i i, I think you're spot on there too i mean i, I you know I, I know you are there I, i've had too many conversations with this type of stuff with with coaches around the nfl the good teams have guts and are aggressive period and with McVay and Les Snead too i think it's a really fantastic working relationship too to where you know McVay can trust Les Snead, the, the, like he trusts his eye, he trusts his work. He comes to him with the Von Miller trade. Les Snead's probably already watched the film to verify it. McVay then, okay, you like it. He knows, okay, I'm going to watch a little too, but I don't have to grind because I trust Les Snead has already grind in that situation. You know, yell down the hallway, hey, Raheem Morris, defensive coordinator, check out the Von Miller film. You think it's good? Do you think he can work in our defense? Blah, blah, blah. And they're the type of group that gets excited about it. And uh, I think that's why it works. And that's why I don't think it's like an extra grind for that group either because it's just a, again, I, I can't speak enough to the atmosphere there in L.A. being there. You know, what was the, the phrase that uh, I heard McVeigh, you know, use? It's just, you know, they're detailed, but they're not, what was it, uh, you know, demeaning, right? They're detailed, but not demeaning, or they're demanding, but not demeaning. And you can get that sense pretty quick there. You know, yeah, they expect intensity. They're not M- MFing you and telling you how horrible you are when you mess things up. They demand you be better. And I think that kind of, like, filters throughout the building. And with the way the league is right now, it's so close. It's set up to be so even. Man, three or four difference makers on your team. The games come down to three or four plays. Uh, Those guys make the difference. And the Rams and some of the other good teams in football have seemed to have figured that out. Yeah, and look, it always seems easier than it is when we're celebrating the one team that won it. It ain't easy. Because you got 31 other teams that are trying to do it. And whether it's the Rams or the Bengals, both teams are going to have the much larger target on their backs in 2022. And uh, there's a reason why it has been so damn long. I remember when I was a kid, I got sick of teams winning back-to-back championships. It gets old. It gets boring. It's Steelers, 74 and 75. That, and before that, the Dolphins, seventy-two Dolphins. and seventy-three. Yeah, they were and there the three Steelers, years in a row. Seventy-eight and yeah. seventy-nine. Right. You just get you. You kind of get to the point where where you it gets it gets old. It gets and but and you accept that that's just the way it is. That the Super Bowl, even though it was this magical day back in the seventies, you kind of accepted the fact that the game sucked, and and we'd have these repeat champions, and it was the same handful of teams, and the salary cap error. I mean, really. Uh, and it just shows you how great the Patriots have been. Yeah, that's it. That they've been able right. to bend it in their direction and win six in 20 years. Yeah. Because now we're seeing, now that Tom Brady's gone from the Patriots, we're seeing how hard it is. And it's going to, and hopefully it will be a different team every year. Hopefully there will be plenty of different cities that get to have the celebration that happened yesterday, even though the Rams seem to think that they're going to have another one next year. Yeah, no, I mean, you know, first off, your your, your thing about the Patriots is, is exactly right. It just, again, I mean, a clinic in team building, a clinic in coaching, a clinic in finding the right psych- psychological approach to the game that fits their football team. You know, the Patriots to me were great as the fact that they took a route that was, you know, a little different. To, you know, I, I think we discussed this a little in the season where it wasn't about the stars. In fact, they were more like, let's get a bunch of like B players and. And now I can have great depth at all these positions that I need that are important to my scheme. And now with these B players, 
I can match up, though, against every team in football. And now I'm such a great coach with my coaching, and now you give me the pieces that match up with that team, I'll figure out a way to beat this team now. And then I'll just acquire, like, two or three stars at really important positions for my team, and that'll put us over the top, a.k.a. make the Randy Moss trade or draft Gronk or get Darrell Revis or Aqib Tlaib like we've talked about. That, to me, is where the Patriots were a little different. It was like value, value, value. Wait, I need a star here and here here okay now we're a Super Bowl team and they were different that way uh, but it was a clinic of course like you said and that's why it's just so special going to be hard to replicate that and and depth yeah quality depth right when the injuries happen exactly that was always a concern for the Rams yeah you get too many injuries to any of these key players Good luck right. with the, the, next, man the, up, Super the Bowl. next man up as an undrafted free agent. Yeah. I mean, we saw the Super Bowl. Odell got hurt, and we went, oh, crap. Who else is on the team on the offense that's going to scare anybody? You know, tight end down, second tight end down. I mean, yeah, that, that's, we saw it. They were dangerously close there to, you know, having one more injury to go, oh, man, that their, their team's not the same. Yeah, so, yeah, they dodged the bullet. They've continued to dodge bullets. But, again, I think that's also a little bit of a credit to McVay and company, too, and knowing what they have as a team and practicing and training the right way for that team to have a good feel, to keep guys that, yeah, it's a top-heavy roster, but keep them fresh and, and limit the injuries. They're doing something right in that department, that's for sure. You know, when you consider what they were down to at receiver and tight end, it makes it even more ridiculous that yes. the Bengals – put Eli Apple on an island against Cooper Cup with the game on the line with the championship on the line it's tough you know you're you're on the they're on the one foot two foot line there you know so you're you're I gonna, know it's hard to double a guy there yeah, I know it's hard, it's hard. I know, and, you're, and, and if you it's put hard. two guys in his face right there you are sending a message someone else is going to have a favorable matchup but you don't have your best players I know Let someone else go one-on-one -on -one against Ben Squaronic no offense to Ben no, Squaronic yeah you're yeah yeah, yeah, yeah I, I hear you it's, it's easy it's easy for us to say it now but man uh when they're diminished like that it justifies more focus on Cooper Cup no, I guess that's well I, I think that's one thing that I, I you know again I had my what the f happened Wednesday podcast yesterday and that was one of the things that you know for do my breakdown of the game that really jumped out to me you know is the fact that I think if the Bengals, when they watch back the film and defensive coordinator Lou Anarumo, who had a great year and is a phenomenal coach, I think the one thing he'll look at is go, man, I wish I would have played more man-to-man -man coverage in the third and fourth quarter and just doubled Cooper Cup and had our other guys play man because they couldn't separate. I mean, really, that was one of the themes that I, I, I certainly took home at the second half of the game. When the Bengals played man, the Rams couldn't do much. When they played zone, and that's what they did on the major, almost every play on that last drive of the game, I mean, every until they got down there on the one, two yard line, they played zone, and Matt Stafford and company, you know, carved them up. Even though, yeah, these guys weren't wide open, but within the zone, there was just enough holes and room for them to fit the ball in there in some tight situations, and that was the difference. I mean, you know, hey, uh, Cooper Cup got manned up on Logan Wilson, uh, you know, two or three times on the last drive of the game. Caught the ball across the middle. Of course, you know that was zone. He he, had the no look pass. He moved Von Bell with his eyes in that zone to hit Cooper Cup behind him. That was one thing that did jump out to me, Mike, to your point about that man and doubling stuff. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.